Good morning, Psalm 48. Um, let me ask you a question if I can start off. But what's the most beautiful city in the world? How do you go about answering that question? What are the criteria? It's not a bad question. I don't know how you answer it, though. Is it New York, Chicago, L.A.? Many of you have been there, and you're probably not going to say it's the most beautiful city. Some people might say London or Rome. Lots of people supposedly say Paris is the most beautiful city in the world. I've never been there. Um, I don't even know what would make it so beautiful, but that's something people say, the most beautiful city. What's the most important city in the world? That may be a little bit easier to answer. Maybe the criteria are a little bit clearer. Again, you might say New York is. That's a very, very powerful, important city. Maybe it's the most important. Or maybe it's London or Moscow or Beijing. In the early 80s, I visited Washington, D.C. for the first time. And I remember becoming overwhelmed. To my great surprise, I was, I was overwhelmed by the city. And, and I, I kind of got flooded with this understanding that this is really, really a very important city. And I considered that it was even more important than New York. In fact, because maybe the decisions that are made in that city, I thought, yeah, I mean, they're worldwide, world-influencing decisions. Maybe Washington, D.C. is the most important city in the world. All right, here's another one. What's the most important mountain? Well, that's an even weirder question. How can you possibly answer that question? You might say, Mount Everest. Surely it's the tallest, but why would that make it the most important mountain? I don't know. It's killed more people than any other mountain, so maybe that's a criterion for importance. It's not actually the deadliest mountain. That's Annapurna in Nepal, which very less, much less people have tried to climb that mountain, but 40% of the people that have tried to climb it have been killed by it. I don't know why a mountain killing you makes it an important one. For me, that would be a mountain I would want to stay away from, right? I think the most important mountain to you would be the one, if there was such a situation as this, a mountain that you ran to, to hide, for safety, to protect your life. You ran to it with all of your life because someone, I don't know how this would happen, someone or something is chasing you down. If you did indeed find that mountain and rested and hid and, and felt protected, you would probably say no matter what the mountain is, that's the most more important mountain in the world. I, I'm guessing. Most cities began as usually some higher location, you know, a good vantage point looking over something, a river or a lake or the coast. Um, many of them start out as forts, right? This, a fort is first established, then the city grows around it. Um, like one of the most important cities, of course, in the world is New York City. And it, it started off, you know, many hundreds of years ago as fortresses. And then the city grew around that. Well, look, some of you have been to Jerusalem. The Bible colors it as the most important city in the world. On the most important mountain in the world. That's how the Bible kind of describes it. Um, now, Jerusalem is not even, you guys, it's not even a mountain. It's just basically a rise, and that's about it. But the Bible calls it an important mountain. At Jesus' time, even, Jerusalem had a population that was about equal to Fuquay Verena, believe it or not. So it's not that big, and it was never that big, and it's not high at all, but it's an important mountain. Why would that be so? The idea of the greatness of Jerusalem was certainly not in its height or its size, or its military power. Um, it did have a magnificent temple, but that's really what we need to think about. It was great because the one true God of the universe chose to make himself uniquely known there. That's why it's important. As in the Garden in Eden, and as he will when he returns, the true God desires to make his dwelling place with humans so that they can be his people and he can be their God. So the, the psalmist, like the entire Bible, invites us to compare and contemplate. And that's what I want you to do from Psalm 48 this morning. The Bible tells us, in fact, really from beginning to end, to compare and contemplate two roads, two gates, two mountains, two cities, Two worldviews. Did Israel have enough evidence to compare and contemplate how great God is? Well, verse 8 says this. Just as we heard, so we have seen. Just as we heard, so have we seen. In the city of the Lord of armies, in the city of our God, God will establish it forever. 
Even before the psalmist wrote, Joshua thought Israel had plenty of evidence to compare and contemplate. Joshua 24, 14, 15 says this, Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Joshua says, think about, you guys, think about where we came from. That's what he's saying to Israel as they enter the promised land. We came from the false gods. He's speaking of Abraham and Sarah. It came from the false gods of Mesopotamia. They left and went across the river Euphrates. And here we are now, the people of God, an enormous number. He's basically saying, how did we get here? And the answer is the one true God brought us here. Now we're in the middle of the gods again, the Amorites. And he saved Joshua saying, you have enough evidence now. You've gotten this far. You got evidence to make the decision. I'm going to serve the true God, not the gods of the Amorites, the ones that are brought here. God has brought, brought us here. So we, do we have enough evidence to compare and contemplate how great God is? Well, you know the answer is yes. I'm going to try to convince you of that. This morning, I want you to compare and contemplate what, as the psalmist does. And we can make a comparison by asking two questions. Where is God? And who's afraid? Now, these are semi-rhetorical questions, but I want to explore them because they're kind of brought up in Psalm 48. And then I want you to contemplate in asking you two more questions. Is God's love faithful? And this one, who's better than Jesus? Hang on for that. In using Psalm 48 as just one guide to comparing God to all other gods and contemplating his greatness, we can learn to practice how to praise him which is my goal at the end of this sermon. Psalm 48, verse 1. The Lord is great and highly praised. Or, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Now, what do you think might be wrong with that first line? Well, you know, in a way it seems too ordinary, too bland, too nondescript. How was the game? Great. How was the food? Great. How do I look? Great. How's the view? Great. How's God? Great. How's God? Thumbs up. Mm. What do you praise highly? I mean, with enthusiasm. Your team, your grandchildren, the restaurant, the singer, the movie. What words do you use? Awesome. Super. Fantastic. Amazing. And the strange, crazy good. These are the words that we use for high praise for something. How should God be praised? Highly. How should God be praised? Smiley face, thumbs up. Something seems like just that is not good enough. But then what he does is helps us to think, to compare and contemplate, so that we know what we mean when we say, God is great. So let's compare by asking two questions. Here's the first one. Where is God? Where is God? In the city of our God, his holy mountain. Rising splendidly is the joy of the whole earth. Mount Zion, the summit of Zaphon, is the city of the great king. God is known as a stronghold in his citizens. Summit of Zaphon means that Mount Zion is higher than the mountain called, or mountain in Zaphon. Now, Zaphon which you're not familiar with. It's no mountain you would really ever want to go to. It's north of Jerusalem. It was considered the capital of the Canaanites. Now, I can't go into the details about the Canaanites, but you can investigate this. But we're talking about the most morally depraved people group in the ancient Middle East, the Canaanites. That's their capital. It was the capital of the worship of the famous god Baal. It stands as what the world without God tries to offer instead of God. 
So it's a symbolic mountain, a real mountain, but a symbolic mountain of something against God. Compare it to God and see what comes up. And the thing is, this mountain is not actually or geographically higher. Jerusalem is not higher than Zaphon. And yet the psalmist says it is higher than Zaphon. Why is it higher than that? Because when you answer the question, where is God? That's the answer to why Jerusalem is the highest mountain in the world. God only dwells in Zion. All mountains of the earth are lower than Mount Zion because God only dwells in Mount Zion. Now listen to this. The whole human race has been running to cities. We've always been doing that. Run to the city. You've got to get rid of, got, got to escape danger, got, maybe escape God even. If we band together, we can solve all human problems. That's basically the philosophy of the human race. We started the problems, and that's true. We'll solve the problems, and that's absurd. That's the most ridiculous thing about us that I can think of. We're the ones that are causing all of Earth's problems, and so who do we go to to solve those problems? And the answer is the problem causer. We go to ourselves. But Hebrews 12, 22 says that the believers have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. He means the believers have come to Christ and we're safe in him. We as believers have gone to the right place to solve human problems, where God is. It's interesting to me that in John's highly symbolic vision that he records, as we know, the book of Revelation. At the end of that book, he sees God coming down as the new Jerusalem. And this highly symbolic description, it's a building that is four square, as long and uh, broad and high as any other thing, over a thousand miles. Those are some serious walls. And you might want to ask the question, what's the danger in the new heaven and new earth that we would have to have walls at high? But there is no danger, and that's the point of the symbol. There is no danger. God is a fortress that we run to and will be safe without any danger or any enemy for all of eternity. And yet this structure has 12 gates in it, three on each of the sides. The Bible says John saw that they were always open. In fact, the, the doors of the gates are made out of pearls. Now, I know pearls are a beautiful sort of thing, but I just want to tell you this if you didn't know some chemistry. A pearl is made out of calcium carbonate. It's chalk. The, the point here is, is that these doors always be opening. It means it, it symbolizes that not only are we always and forever protected by God if it, with his presence, but we always have access to him like we've never had before. In other words, God is where we are and we are where God is. So if we ask why God is great and should be praised, it is that he chooses to dwell with those people whom he has redeemed for his own. Compared to all the other gods in this world, my God, our God, is the one who loves us enough to come down to us and save us. So where is God? He's in his people. Where is God? He's in the church. And through the Holy Spirit, each one of God's redeemed. That's where God is. Compare God to all the other gods. Here's the second question. Who's afraid? Who's afraid? Are you afraid this morning? Is anyone afraid this morning? Listen to this. Verse 4 says, look, the kings assembled. They advanced together. The, the opponents of God always are thinking, if we just have enough people, we can outnumber God and defeat God. And they never can. This reminds me of the great Tower of Babel in the book of Genesis. The world is so wicked, even after the flood, it's been repopulated. And they get together and say, like, we don't want to ever get scattered. If we can stay together, we can rule ourselves. In fact, they even say, if we can stay together, we'll make a name for ourselves. And so they build this great tower. And I love this part of that story. The Bible says that God saw this and came down. What are they doing? And he confuses their languages and he scatters them throughout the whole world. Oh, if we just pile up together, we can defeat God. No, you can't. It reminds me of, 
of the demon-possessed man in the land of the, the gatherings in Jesus' life. Now, Jesus had taken demons out of all kinds of people. He did it all the time. But one time in the land of the gatherings, there was a specially vicious demon-possessed man. He lived among the tombs. He was naked. He was cut up. Every time people tried to chain him because he was so violent, he would break the chains. And Jesus came to him. And the, the demon said, I know who you are, Jesus, son of God. And Jesus says, what is your name? And they answer, legion, for we are many. And just with the word of his mouth, Jesus cast them all out. Kings assemble, they advance together. Maybe we can outnumber Jesus. Oh, no, you can't. But verse 5 says, they looked and froze with terror. They fled in, with fear. Excuse me, they fled in terror. Trembling seized them, agony like that of a woman in labor. As you wrecked the ships of Tarshish with the east wind. Who's afraid of God? Humans who try to defeat God and his people, but not us. Moses said in Exodus 15 in a great song, the nations will hear and tremble. He's trying to encourage Israel. I know this looks frightening, but, but the nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. The leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. The people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall on them. By the power of your arm, God, they will be as still as a stone until your People pass by, Lord, until the people you bought pass by. And then indeed, later on, we read in the book of Numbers, chapter 22, now Balak, Balak's the great false prophet, son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was terrified because there were so many people. Indeed, Moab was filled with dread because of the Israelites. How did the people of the Middle East back then even know what God was doing through Israel? One thing you need to understand is that, that news traveled much, much faster than you're thinking. With people on the road all the time going from one place to the other, they're capturing information and it was just standard procedure as you pass by. What's the news? What have you heard? And news was shared all the time. And so one particular frightening story was the story of, was the story of a very, very old man and his wife who didn't have any children at all, which means the gods didn't like them. But the one true God said, I want you to go from there over there, cross that river. I want you to go to a new place. I'm going to give you that place. I'm not only going to give you that place. I'm going to give you so many children that you cannot count them. This to an old man and woman. And they went. And when they went, eventually after waiting, God gave them a son and grandsons and so many children that it was impossible to really count. And they ended up in the land of Egypt at one time because of a famine. And they grew and they grew. Now remember when we're talking about Egypt and Pharaoh, you must understand something. This is a frighteningly powerful king and kingdom, Egypt. You must understand that. And so the news goes. And so this people became greater and greater and greater. And Pharaoh enslaved them. And Pharaoh was afraid of them. And, and then that one single true God came down and said, let my people go. And then he did all these strange, horrible plagues on these people. And, and so then the greatest king in the world let them go. But then changed his mind. And these people, this huge throng of people came up to the Red Sea. And the Red Sea came apart. And they walked through. And then when Pharaoh and his army came to get them because they changed their mind, then the waters came back over and defeated the army of Pharaoh. Please try to get what I'm saying right here. Oh, no. These people are on their way here. That's the fear and the dread. In fact, this is what Rahab, the prostitute of Jericho, had heard with all kinds of different men over the weeks and years and coming through with new information, she learned about the God of Israel and said, we're defeated. I'm going to go with that God. And so she, she hid the spies and saved them. And she and her family was, was saved. The news had spread. She believed it. People are afraid when they see the, the, the God of Israel, the one true God acting and working. And then you know what? 
there was probably this thought, okay, so they went through the Red Sea, but now they're in the desert. They're all going to die. You, you've never even been to the desert, and you know there's no food or water there. They're all going to die. They didn't die. They, how do you go through the desert and you don't die? There were, God gave them water and food, and their shoes didn't even wear out. I am terrified of these people and their God. And then the psalmist says here, you know who also is afraid? The ships of Tarshish. He's, he's nailing the great ships that go from Spain to the beginning of the Middle East, through the Mediterranean Sea with huge cargoes of wealth and all the arrogance and pride at wealth and commerce and business. And, and the Bible says that all God needs to do is just to blow the east wind and sink every one of those ships. Listen, I don't know if this will ever happen, but at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea is an innumerable number of ships with incredible cargo, and we're probably never going to find them again. But God just blows the east wind and reminds us that he's in charge, so much so that the book of Ezekiel and in the end of Revelation, it's brought up again about God destroying the ships of Tarshish. So the psalmist here is saying the world trusts in, in, in governments and commerce and business and wealth, but they should be afraid of the God who blows the east wind. Be afraid, world, but not us, not us. No, you guys, we, we say with Psalm 118, the Lord is on my side. I'm not going to fear. What can man do to me? Who's afraid? The world, but not us. Now let's contemplate. Verse 9 says this. God, within your temple, we contemplate your faithful love. Is God's love faithful? No, it is. But think about this. God gave Adam and Eve everything. They broke the one law that God gave. I'm still furious with Adam and Eve. They started a long line of dominoes. They tipped the first one, and I'm at the end of this domino line. I'm, I'm suffering because of their mistake. Just kidding, everybody. I would have made the exact same mistake. But how gracious was God? One day I just want to write a book about the grace of God despite the sin of man. The grace of God begins in the garden. That's how faithful God's love is. They live to an old age. Has God been faithful to you when you can't even keep his simple commands, church? Yeah, God's faithful. The world of Noah's time was relentlessly wicked from top to bottom, but Noah found what? Grace in the eyes of the Lord. Is God faithful to you when the morals of the world around you have almost already been flushed down the toilet? Yeah, God is faithful. His love is faithful. God made a promise to old Abraham, Abram and Sarah and about having children and when they were too old. And, and then God made them wait. After all that, he still made them wait. But then God gave them uncountable children, as I said. Is God's love secure for you even when he makes you wait? Yes. God's love was faithful to Israel as slaves in Egypt. He did not ignore their cries. He did not forget his promises. After Israel escaped, they complained and complained. And God still faithfully gave them water and food and shoes that never wear out. Does God still love you even when you forget his love for you? Does he? Isn't God's love for you steadfast even when you complain? Isn't it? At what stage of our being did Christ die for us? Romans 5, so important, says this. While we were sinners, while we were weak, while we were enemies, Christ died for us. It reminds me of the, uh, maybe a mom might say, like, don't go out in that mud puddle. Don't play in the mud. But the kid does it anyway. You know, you're not going to get in here with those muddy shoes, those muddy clothes, and that mud all over. You're, I'm not going to let you in. I'm not going to let you mess up the house. But he comes to the door anyway. And, and what God does is, is, is doesn't say, now you got to clean yourself up first. And then you can come in. No, he takes you while you're dirty and lets you come in. And then cleans you up. Um, you know, when I think about what God has done for us, 
and all that we could think of that might take us away, Paul reminds us, he was persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels or rulers or things present or things to come or powers or height or depth or any creature will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord, even when you sin. Nothing will separate you. Is God's love faithful? Yes. Describe your condition before you were saved, please. Tell me about any ways you resisted God and resisted the message of the gospel. Did God reject you? No. How can you be where you are in life right now and say that God has ever abandoned you? How did you get here? I'm looking at you right now and thinking, how did you guys even get to this spot yet? God didn't abandon you. Show me your journal of answers to prayer. Contemplate God's patience with you. Don't, you. don't you, all of us, have our own story of God's faithful love? I do. If you begin your autobiography this year, won't it have plenty of personal evidence of the faithful love of God in your life? That's, that's a summertime project for you. Get your autobiography going. We'll just call it part one because I'm sure there's many more things to go. But is it not already filled with God's faithful love to you? My autobiography includes great American privilege and includes a wonderful Christian family, a Christian education. But what has been my stewardship of all that, you guys? I eat too much food. I watch too much TV. I don't pray enough. I don't give enough. I don't sacrifice enough. I'm talking about me now. Everything I do seems half-hearted at best. I do not love my wife like Christ loves the church. I do not love my neighbor just like I love myself. And I don't love the Lord my God with all of my heart, soul, and strength. And yet God's faithful love is given to me. We're not truly faithful, yet the faithful of the Lord covers us every day. Here's why I can say the Lord is great and praised greatly. Verse 10 says this, like your name, God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with justice. Mount Zion is glad. Judah's villages rejoice because of your judgments. And then he says, go around Zion. Encircle it. Count its towers. Consider its ramparts. Tour its citadels so that you can tell a future generation, this our God forever and ever. He will always lead us. Take a tour. Hey, look at this podium. It's got four nice little bolts right here. I like the angle. It's, it's just about the right angle for putting something on there. You know, when you go down there, I see that it's got these poles, these metal poles right here, which are very, very sturdy. And I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but I see these welds right here on these bars are really good. There's four of them down that side. There's two of them on the back. Um, I like it. I like this sign right here. Redeemer. It's not, it's not ostentatious, but it you know, just says, it remind you, just in case you thought you were a peak wave arena middle school Baptist church, it's actually Redeemer. Um, it's got good symmetry. You've noticed that. Did you notice these bars right here? They've got good welds here and you know, it's the same thing on the other side, too. It's not three, it's not two or three, but it's, it's four. It's got a really good base. It's got those same bars right there. This is a really, really good podium. Looks like the kind of thing, that if I need to ram down a door, I could do that. Or if I needed to hide, and I'm not sure if I could fit in there during a tornado, but it just looks really, really sturdy. Go around. Encircle. Count. Note. Tour. See, what are we 21st century Christians going to do? Go to Jerusalem? Take a trip to Jerusalem? Almost nothing is left of the walls of Jerusalem. There's part of the Western Wall, that's all. The temple has been long gone. There's no Ark of the Covenant. No, Indiana Jones never found that. God is not in Jerusalem. He hasn't been there for a long time. Israel was invited to praise God because God chose to dwell with his people in communion and blessing through the image and sacrificial activity of a, of a building, a building in a specific city a specific city in a particular land. In the Lord Jesus Christ, God has come down to dwell with us, to commune with us. 
to provide the sacrifice. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's why they rejoice, says Revelation 5, 5. He's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the final sacrifice for sin. Jesus is the high priest and king. He is the temple. He is Zion. Jesus is the new Jerusalem. So we must learn to compare Jesus to everything else on this earth. Contemplate anything and everything when it is right next to the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything, put it side by side with Jesus and compare. Who's better than Jesus? Who's the most righteous person in the universe? Jesus. He faced every kind of temptation known to man. Any human being. He literally was face to face with the devil, Satan, Lucifer, the father of all lies, the murderer from the beginning. Three times. No sin. Who's the smartest person in the universe? Jesus. My wife has 16 organic chemistry textbooks in her office. It's horrible. Jesus created organic chemistry. The greatest meteorologist in the world is Tom Myers. He predicts the weather. Jesus creates weather. Who's the wisest person in the universe? Jesus. He knows exactly what it takes for me to be successful and happy. I go to him, Jesus, the wisdom of God, and say, like, that's what my life is all about. That's where joy and happiness comes from. He's wise. And by the way, just watch him destroy the wisdom of the wise and his choices. Who's the most courageous person in the universe? Jesus. He accepted the very wrath of God over sin and took it on himself. Who's the most powerful person in the universe? Jesus. By him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. He holds them all together. He's delivered us from the domain of darkness and has defeated death and sin, and the devil? Who's the most tender-hearted and forgiving person in the universe? It's Jesus. He's gentle and lowly in heart. He's the friend of sinners. On the cross, he forgave his executioners. Every disciple left him, and he forgave and restored them. I'll tell you what, look in the mirror. And contemplate. If who you see in the mirror were the only person forgiven of sin, the one in the mirror is the only person he's ever forgiven, then Jesus is the most forgiving person in the universe. Are you disappointed in your parents? Of course you are. They're not Jesus. Disappointed in your husband? Of course you are. You didn't marry Jesus. What were you thinking? Disappointed in your wife? She's not Jesus. Disappointed in the politician you did or did not vote for? Of course you are. They're not Jesus. Disappointed in your teachers and doctors and lawyers and mechanics and on and on? Of course you are. None of them are Jesus. Disappointed in your elders? Of course you are. They're sheep just like you. And not Jesus, the great shepherd. We use the word best all the time. Think about it. Try to stop using the word best, except for Jesus. When you use the word best for literally anything in your life, I just want you to know that we don't really actually believe you, just so you know. It may seem an undescriptive thing to say, but Jesus is the best. You came to the best. When you came to him, you truly, actually, literally came to the best. So when you contemplate Jesus and know that you have him, then you can say, the Lord is great and great to praise him. I want you to do three things this week, maybe for the rest of your life. First, contemplate, think, meditate. Know the track record of God in the life of Israel. That means be a Bible student. And in the early church, be a New Testament student. 
Um, be a Bible reader, of course. Know the exploits of God also in church history. Ask for and listen to the story of God's faithful love in your fellow believers. Review to yourself and your children what God has done and is doing in your lifetime. Which leads me to the second thing. Speak up. Talk about it. Do this so that you can tell, as Psalm 40 says, you can tell all generations. You know, speak up, highly praise him. Teach your children. Tell your generation at community groups or D groups or a ladies gathering anywhere and everywhere. Tell anyone and everyone why God is so great. That is not too hard. Do that this week. And lastly, stay faithful. Most of you won't know that there was a Texas football coach named Daryl Royal. He was very, very successful back in the 50s and 60s, I think. Lots of good winning streaks. And one winning streak, one season, he had won a whole bunch of games and then lost two in a row. And the, the news reporter said, are you going, what are you going to do, Coach Royal? Are you going to change the lineup? Are you going to do something different with some different personnel in there so that you don't lose three in a row? And he said, no, dance with the one who brung you. I'm not going to change up just because we lost two. These guys have brought me this far. I'm not going to change it up just because we lost two games. Dance with the one who brung you. Stay faithful. One time Jesus taught that it is himself who is the true bread of life. And that his blood is the true drink that brings eternal life. And John, when he records that, says that many followers of Jesus, many of them were offended at Jesus for saying things like that. And they stopped following Jesus. When Jesus asked the 12 disciples if they were also going to leave, Peter replied, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we believe. You've brought me this far. I'm not going to leave you. You're a faithful God. I compare you to everything else. You're the faithful God. I'm not going to leave you, even when things get hard. When the trials of life do get hard, and, and they have and they will, where are you going to go to? You've compared Jesus to all other saviors, or you should do that. You have contemplated why he is the best. He's brought you this far. He'll complete what he has started. So stay faithful. Pray with me this morning.